Welcome to another episode of the Minor Tweak Major Impact Podcast. This episode is the last of the season. In this episode, we speak with Dr. Laura Volpicelli Delay, who is part of the CCI Neurodegeneration Challenge Network. Laura is an associate professor in the neurology department at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. She earned her PhD in neuroscience at Emory University, where she studied how neuronal protein trafficking is disrupted in Alzheimer's disease. She then trained in the fundamentals of neuron cell biology at Yale University, followed by neurodegenerative disease training at the University of Pennsylvania. In this episode, we speak with Laura about her work, her involvement with the Chain Zuckerberg Initiative Neurodegeneration Challenge Network, challenges with methods for neurodegeneration, and more. So let's jump right in. Laura, I would like to welcome you to the Minor Tweak Major Impact Podcast. Thank you. I feel privileged to be invited. It's an honor. Thanks. Great. Laura, to get started, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what you're currently working on? Sure. So I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I went to college in Pennsylvania where I majored in math, and I also studied English literature. I then went to graduate school in neuroscience, and I got my PhD in Alan Levy's lab. And he's an expert in Alzheimer's disease, so that's the focus of my research there. I then did a postdoc at Yale University, and then I was a senior researcher at the University of Pennsylvania before coming to University of Alabama at Birmingham. And here I'm an associate professor in the neurology department, and my lab is focused on synucleinopathies. So these are neurodegenerative diseases characterized by clumps of a protein called synuclein in the brain. And I'm trying to figure out how these clumps of synuclein are leading to neurodegeneration. Um, And some diseases that you might have heard of are Parkinson's disease and dementia with Lewy body. So we're hoping that if we can prevent the clumping of synuclein or clear them from the brain, we can prevent them. Great. And how and when really did you get interested first in neuroscience or more specifically neurodegeneration research? So I got interested in graduate school where I studied Alzheimer's disease. And yeah, I was really interested in memory and then how that's impaired in neurodegeneration. I also, my mentor at Emory was phenomenal, Dr. Alan Levy. I think he's the one that really just got me interested in Alzheimer's disease. And he was the kind of mentor that you know, gave me a lot of independence and really encouraged me, but he also was able to kind of stop me up from going off on a deep end. So I think having him as my mentor really helped me get interested in neurodegenerative disease. And then my postdoc was in kind of basic cell biology. It was more focused on how lipids influence synaptic transmission. But then when I worked with Virginia Lee and John Trojanowski at the University of Pennsylvania, I became interested specifically in Parkinson's disease and how synuclein aggregates can cause Parkinson's disease. But I think synucleinopathies can affect, you know, they can cause dementia as well as motor symptoms. So I think there's some overlap between, you know, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And now shifting gears a little bit. So I really know you or I met you virtually through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, because the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and they have this initiative called the Neurodegeneration Challenge Network, and your team is involved with that. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what that is about and how really your team is involved with that. So I know you through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and the reason I got involved is because I know Margaret Sutherland very well. She was previously a program officer at the NIH, and I knew her through that and through funding of my NIH grant. And then she moved to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and she reached out to me to give a talk on models of Parkinson's disease. So I gave a talk to CZI about Parkinson's disease models in mice and rats, And then through that, she asked me to contribute my protocol on the synuclein fibro model to IO protocols. And I was really happy to do that because I have people contacting me all the time on the synuclein fibro model, how to get it to work, how to optimize it. And it's really nice to be able to share this protocol with everybody in the Parkinson's disease community so that they can replicate what I've done in my lab 
Um, and I can also share minor details that can either make or break the protocol. So working with you on submitting this protocol has been really helpful for me. And I think it's been really helpful for other people. Great. And can you maybe talk a little bit about that specific protocol? And also, how did you go about really developing that protocol? With the protocol, what we do is we purify some nucleic proteins. So we use E. coli that will make a whole bunch of the protein. And then we purify it. And you can take this nucleic protein and throw it in a test tube and shake it for seven days. And it'll form amyloid fibrils, which are similar to what your Parkinson's disease brain. And then we take these fibrils, we sonicate them to break them up in small fragments. And then we can add them to primary neurons in a dish, or we can inject them into a mouse or rat brain. And what it does is it causes the normal synuclein in the brain to now form aggregates that are, again, very similar to what you see in a Parkinson's disease brain. So they look like what you see in a Parkinson's disease brain. Biochemically, they behave that way. They're in brain regions that are very relevant for Parkinson's disease. So what's really nice about the protocol is I can share details of what buffer is important to use for making the fibrils, exactly how to sonicate them so that you can get everything to work. And you know, I've developed that over years and really been obsessive compulsive about optimizing it so it works and it's very robust. And then through IO protocols, I'm able to share these minute details with the community so that they can get it to work as well. Great. And is there anything new or different in that specific method in comparison to other existing methods, if there are even other methods? Yeah, so I did help develop the method at the University of Pennsylvania. I do want to give credit to Kelvin Luke, who is a scientist at the University of Pennsylvania as well. And I'm the one that took the fibrils and discovered that if we take them and add them to primary neurons in a dish, just normal neurons, it doesn't have to be neurons overexpressing a mutant human form of the protein. I found that if we add them to normal neurons, it'll corrupt the normal endogenous synuclein. But since moving to UAB, I've modified the protocol. I have spent a lot of time figuring out what is the best buffer to use so that the fibrils are always stable. Now we always get the same fibrils every time we make them. So it all depends on the concentration of the salt that we have, the type of buffer. Instead of using PBS, we like to use a TRIZ buffer. And the pH is really important. Then we've also really optimized how we sonicate. So when you sonicate them, it's really high power sonication to break the fibrils into small fragments. And we found that if we, say, use a probe tip sonicator, it generates a lot of heat. The fibrils will aggregate and be completely non-functional. So we spend a lot of time, you know, what's the best sonicator to use? What's the best temperature to use for the sonicator so that the fibrils remain stable? So we spend a lot of time optimizing it. But what's nice about IO protocols is I can have all these details. Sometimes I can't have in the methods section of a paper. And I can explain, here are the critical points in the protocol that will make or break it for you. That sounds great. And I'll be sure to also add the link to the protocol to the show notes. So if anyone wants to take a look at the protocol in more detail, feel free to take a look. So now my next question is a question that I always ask on this show. And it is, did you ever experience a minor tweak major impact moment with your research or maybe even with that particular method? And that means maybe there was this little tiny tweak that it took you quite a long time to figure out. And did you do that in order for the method to work or maybe something worked in one person's hand and it didn't work in the other person's hand and it was like this little thing that really broke the method. Did you ever experience anything like that? Yeah, so it was all about the salt. So we put potassium chloride in with the fibrils. We were having a problem with PBS. So everybody orders bottles of PBS or makes their own phosphate buffer and saline. And it can really differ in how it's made across labs, whether or not it has calcium or magnesium. So sometimes we make it in PBS and everything would work great, and sometimes it wouldn't. And we wouldn't get a lot of aggregation synuclein in the brains. So what I did is we actually went and looked at some really old papers from the 1990s, Peter Lansbury, some really classic biochemistry papers. And we saw that he made all the fibrils using tris buffer and potassium chloride. And so when we just added potassium chloride and changed to tris buffer, now our fibrils are completely stable. They're completely robust. So that was a kind of a minor tweak, huge impact. You know. And I think it goes back to looking at some of the old literature when protocols were actually written out in detail and methods were written out. Interesting. And how long did it take you to figure that out? 
It was a lot of frustration. So we would inject mice with these fireballs and wait six months later to see if we had some queen aggregation in the brain and loss of dopamine neurons. So it took a long time because we had several cohorts of mice just didn't work very well. I think it took a while to really pour through the literature and find the best way and the best buffer to use. But once we did it, it worked beautifully. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing that story. So my next question is a little bit more broader, but I was wondering what kind of challenges do you face with your research on Parkinson disease or maybe body dementia or neurodegenerative diseases in general when it comes to really developing new methods or optimizing existing ones? Are there like any specific things that really stand out that are specific for your research field that's like a challenge? Yeah, so I think my biggest challenge right now is making sure that the animal models can translate to the human disease. So with the fibro model, we get you know, it looks like Lewy pathology in the brain. We get loss of dopamine neurons, which also happens in the Parkinson's disease brain. But we don't necessarily get inflammation in the brain. So we're trying to work out how we can change the fibrils or change our methods so that we can get inflammation, which would be very similar to what you see in a Parkinson's brain. And then I think it's really important to validate the animal models. There's been a lot of problems in the past that Parkinson's models, they find a treatment that's protective, that protects neurons from dying, and then they move on to the clinical trials and they fail. So you know, how can we have an animal model that best predicts treatments that would work in the human situation, I think is the biggest challenge. Yeah, that does sound tricky. What are some things that can be done to make sure that the animal model translates to humans? Sure. So one thing um, we're looking at you know, with the fibrils, if we look at different post-translational modifications on the protein, can we get inflammation? Because the Parkinson's brains do show inflammation. So what can we do differently with our fibril protocol to induce inflammation similar to what in Parkinson's brain? And then some of our behavior phenotypes that we see in the mice just aren't as robust as what you can see in a Parkinson's disease brain. So what can we do to make sure that we have motor defects in the mice? And how can we optimize the fibrils so that we can get more robust phenotypes? That's very interesting. My next question, it's almost the last question already of this show, but it's a fun question. And I always ask if you were allowed to make a rich for tool that would make the life of researchers easier and work more efficient, what would that be? And this is really our fun question and any answers are allowed. Is there anything that you usually, when you're doing your work, you think, oh, it would be so convenient if I had that. It would make my life so much easier if this would. So on Twitter today, one of my colleagues posted that Western blots were invented in 1979. And they showed a picture of scientists before 1979, and the scientists were all happy and enjoying themselves. But if we can somehow just get rid of the need for Western blots, you don't know how many, I've run thousands of them, and they take three to four days, and sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work. And I don't know how to get over that. There's some kind of magic Western blotting machine, I think. And they've tried, companies have tried, but it's still, yeah, we could just somehow get rid of the need for Westerns or make it faster. <laughs> I think a lot of graduate students have suffered because of the Western blot. Yeah, that would be super cool if we had a magical Western blot machine. A lot of researchers would like that too. I used to, in grad school, only develop Westerns on Fridays because I decided that Fridays were my good luck days. So I would time everything so that it was Friday. And in my lab, we actually have offerings to the Western gods. So it's become superstitious, crazy behavior. <laughs> That's funny. Laura, is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners today? I mean, the only thing I can share is sometimes it's good to be a little bit obsessive with your protocols and just, again, minor changes make a huge impact in whether or not your protocol is working. So just spending time on minor details like pH, the salt concentration, temperature, they can make a huge difference. And then I also really just want to thank you for IO protocols because it's really nice that I can have this way to share with the community the protocols in detail, which sometimes just doesn't work when I publish in method sections in a paper. Or if I do something to change it, if I have to wait to publish a paper, that could be a couple of years. But with IO protocols, I can update it in real time. It's just really important in science that we're able to replicate each other's work validate it. So I think what you do is um, really important. 
And thank you so much for sharing your protocols. I think that's just as important that we have researchers like you who are sharing their methods with the community. Laura, thank you so much for being with us today and for sharing your stories and insights on the Minor Tweak Major Impact podcast. My pleasure. Thank you. This program was produced by H Media. We'll see you soon.